Hello lovelies, in this video we're going to be looking at the importance of homeostasis for your A-level biology. Now Dr Edwards is going to take you through all of the important bits in here and then we're going to look at temperature control, positive and negative regulation as well. Hi everyone, okay so we are going to start looking at homeostasis now which is the rest of this part of the topic and so first of all we need to understand what homeostasis means so homeostasis comes from this idea of being balanced or staying the same and that is in our context in the body is saying that it's keeping that internal environment and optimum so it's maintaining that internal optimum conditions inside the body now we've looked at one of the main systems that your body uses to help maintain this internal environment because it's the nervous system. So we've already looked at this quite in a lot of detail. So we talk about the fact that it sends signals through action potentials, they are electrical signals which travel through neurons and the kind of system that works is that we have receptors, they send messages through neurons to a coordinator, your brain or your spinal cord and then that message gets sent to your effector which is muscles or glands which cause about the change. We've looked at some of those already. The other system that your body uses to maintain homeostasis is your endocrine system. This is all of the glands in your body. So glands are specialised organs or tissues that secrete hormones. So the signals they're sending are not electrical signals, they're chemical signals, which is what a hormone is, that are being released from the glands and they travel through the bloodstream. And, but the system about how it brings about change is very similar. So there are receptors, then there's a coordinator, which is usually a band, but not always. It can sometimes be the brain, for example. And then we have an effector, which is various organs can bring about changes. So they could be other glands, but it could be other things like the liver, for example, which we'll look at when we do blood glucose. So we've got these two systems. They work in similar ways, but they've got differences between them as well. We're mostly going to focus on the endocrine system when we look at homeostasis. But there'll be bits that we can talk about with the nervous system as well. So bring in some of that knowledge that we've already looked at. OK, so it's important for the body con to control several factors to maintain homeostasis. And these are all controlled by negative feedback mechanisms. We're going to look at negative feedback um, in a minute. But briefly, we kind of need to think about some examples of things that the body controls through homeostasis and why it's important that it is controlled. So the main one or an easy one that you probably would have learned about potentially already at GCSE and will know the reasons why is your body temperature. So too high enzymes can denature because obviously bonds can be broken in the tertiary structure that's holding the shape together. So therefore the substrate will no longer fit into the active site and we can't have chemical reactions. And that's obviously a problem because chemical reactions control a lot of our body processes, things like respiration. Too low is also bad as well, though. So reactions will slow down when the temperature is too low, because there's just not enough kinetic energy for the particles moving around for us to actually have the energy to complete those reactions. And that's also a bad thing as well. So anything where our reactions will be too slow, or the enzymes controlling the reactions are going to denature, is going to slow down processes in the body and prevent life cycles. So your optimum is about 37 degrees C. Obviously, there is some leeway here. It can be a little bit higher, a little bit lower, depending on age and all sorts of things, whether you are ill. But if it gets past a certain temperature, that becomes dangerous. Either way, you can either have a really high dangerous fever or be hypothermic. The next one is the pH of blood. So mostly we're talking about blood, blood plasma here, tissue fluid, that pH. And the optimum is about 7.35 to 7.45. Obviously, this is excluding certain places in the body, like the stomach, for example, that obviously needs a low pH of 2. And other places where it could be around pH 8, like your small intestine. But the majority of tissue fluid and blood plasma around all of your cells should be around that neutral pH. If it deviates too far from this, this can be an issue because it can affect enzymes again. So we've got um, this idea of ionic bonding being disrupted by OH minus ions or H plus ions in solution, which is obviously what pH is measured by. And so they can be denatured. Those ionic bonds can be disrupted. Same thing as temperature. Tertiary structure is disrupted. The shape no longer fits with the substrate. There is no reaction occurring. 
So it's for similar reasons to temperature, but our blood pH also needs to be controlled. So that's thinking of things like the carbonic acid that dissolves if um, there's too much carbon dioxide present, if we're not getting rid of it from the body properly. That's exact, sort of one of the examples we talked about of um, the pH kind of changing in blood. So another factor, hopefully, again, you'll be familiar with this from GCSE, is your blood glucose levels. We obviously, it's important that we have enough glucose in the blood that we have it there to be transported for various processes, specifically respiration. But also, the presence of glucose in the blood actually affects water potential. If you think about it, it's a dissolved substance. It makes a solution. So if there's too high blood glucose levels, so you've got a lot of glucose dissolved in your blood plasma, the water potential of your blood will be lower. And if you've got too little blood glucose and other dissolved substances in the blood, then your blood water potential can be really high. And that's something that needs to be controlled because the cells around it that's going to cause osmotic effects. So blood glucose level is important to control for the reason that we need the, enough glucose to be circulating around in order to be able to carry out processes that require uh, glucose, such as respiration. But also we need to think about how much there is in the blood because that's going to sort of be determined our water potential which of our blood plasma and our tissue fluid around our cells, which can affect the cells. Which brings us on to the final one, which is blood water content. So the water content, again, of blood and of the tissue fluid, the water potential of those is very important. We need to maintain it because if we don't have it within a sort of an isotonic range for our cells cytoplasm, then it's going to cause osmotic effects of the cells can cause shrinking or bursting, obviously, to the extremes. So being able to make sure that the water potential stays within a certain range so that it is isotonic to our cells is very important. We also need water for some reactions. So it's important for metabolism of cells so that they can keep going and carrying out the reactions that require water. Thinking about condensation and hydrolysis reactions. If we don't have enough water present, then hydrolysis reactions are not going to be able to be carried out as efficiently. And so all of this is important. And so osmoregulation, the regulation of the um, water potential of the body is very important. And we're going to look at that in this topic as well. So I mentioned negative feedback and that all of those conditions are controlled by negative feedback processes. And that's true. Negative feedback is a continuous cycle that goes on in the body in various places, in various processes. If a factor in the internal environment, one of those we've just been looking at or something else, increases or decreases above or below the optimum level, then changes will take place to restore the conditions to that optimum. So, for example, something, a condition increases above the optimum level, so it moves away from the optimum level as an increase. That increase is going to be detected by receptors. As we said, it's going to be the same mechanism that we looked at with nerves, where we've got a receptor, a coordinator, an effector, and a response. The receptors send signals to the effector, or they will send signals to a coordinator, which sends signals to an effector. Then the effector is going to bring about a change. It's going to react in some way that brings about a change to decrease that condition back down towards the optimum. And then the condition returns towards the optimum level and starts to decrease. Now, this is exactly the same thing as I said, it's a cycle. So that um, factor is going to be decreasing towards the optimum. It might then decrease past the optimum and carry on going or it could decrease for another reason at another time. So it decreases below the optimum. That decrease is detected by receptors again, which send signals to the effector, or will send signals to a coordinator, which sends signals to the effector. And then the effectors are stimulated and they cause the change, which hopefully will return, start to return the factor back to the optimum level. And again, the condition increases and goes back towards the optimum. And this can go up and down and up and down and up and down constantly. It is a continuous cycle to make sure that whatever the condition is, it is maintained within the limits that are acceptable for the body. And we don't have any conditions going too far away from the optimum at any time. 
So the opposite of negative feedback is positive feedback, where a response increases the stimulus and then takes conditions further away from the optimum. It's rarer in biology, especially in humans, but they do still happen. And you can see the difference the most between these if you look at them kind of represented graphically. So negative feedback, remember, always returns conditions towards the optimum. So it moves away from the optimum too high and then back down towards the optimum. And then it goes too low and then it comes back up towards the optimum. And this will keep oscillating like this within that range that's being kept acceptable within the body in the conditions. The opposite then is positive feedback. So if something starts to move away from the optimum level, or there isn't an optimum, it's just move away from the normal level, it will keep going and keep going and keep going and keep going away almost exponentially. And this is obviously very, very different. It deliberately moves conditions away from the optimum. The negative feedback examples are the ones we've talked about and that we're going to look into. So temperature, blood glucose, blood water content, all of those things. Positive feedback examples, again, they exist. They're, they're rare where they exist. So Contractions during childbirth, the kind of baby's head pushing and that pressure on the cervix actually causes the release of oxytocin, which causes contractions. The contractions cause the baby to push more against the cervix, which releases more oxytocin. And we go round and round and round, uh, getting more and more and more oxytocin and more and more contractions until the baby is born. Blood clotting, if one or few cells send out the signal to clot, then more cells are stimulated to send out more blood clotting factors. And that increases and increases and increases until the blood clot is formed. Hypothermia, if your temperature drops really, really rapidly and drops too low too quickly for your body to be able to bring it back up, then if your normal body systems, your normal negative feedback can't actually fix your body temperature, then your body temperature gets too low. And like we said, that causes your metabolic rate to become really low, which means that your respiration, all of your other reactions can't happen as fast which means they're not able to bring your temperature back up. And so your temperature drops even lower and you just get colder and colder and colder. And that's why hypothermia is so dangerous because your normal body systems to restore your temperature aren't able to work. And so then your reactions get slower and slower and slower. Okay. So again, you may see examples of positive feedback in exam questions. It's, it's rarer though. And if uh, you see graphs that look like this, that's why negative feedback looks like that, because it's always returning something to the optimum, whereas positive feedback is very much moving away from the optimum. OK, so we're going to look at temperature control briefly, and then we're going to go into a lot more detail on the other factors we've talked about. So the hypothalamus in the brain is the area that contains the thermoregulatory centre, and it contains receptors that are sensitive to temperature of the blood. So that's where our receptors are. It also receives nervous impulses from thermoreceptors that you have in your skin, and then it sends impulses. So the hypothalamus has the receptors, but also acts as the coordinator here. And it sends the impulses along motor neurons to various effectors. So the, this time we're using nerve signals, we're using the nervous system to control temperature, we're not using hormones. So one of the effectors are the pyloerector muscles in your skin, which are responsible for raising and lowering your skin hairs. So if you are too cold, then, and the hypothalamus detects this, electrical impulses, action potentials are sent down motor neurons to these muscles, and they are supposed to contract. And as they contract, they will pull up your hairs to stand up straight. This is when you have goosebumps and all your hairs stand on end. That's what this is when you're cold and that raising of the hairs traps a load of air that is able to then insulate you around that layer of skin. It is obviously left over from when we had more hair on our bodies um, because the hair we actually have doesn't actually make that much of a difference. You see this in other mammals as well. Um, they do it in order to kind of give themselves that insulating layer and obviously it works better if you have way more body hair. If you are too hot, then the impulse is sent to do the opposite. They tell those muscles to relax. And so therefore, the hairs are lowered because we don't need to have that insulating layer of air anymore. The sweat glands also in your skin. So this is a gland that's an effect of this time instead of a muscle. But they will be stimulated by the nervous system again to produce more sweat when you are hot so that you can lose heat energy by evaporating that sweat the liquid of sweat off your skin 
um, and through evaporation. So we lose heat energy that way and it just allows us to cool down. Skeletal muscles, so mostly this is your arms and your legs, but this has potentially also happened in other parts of your body if you've been really, really cold. Um, when you are really, really cold, your um, hypothalamus is going to stimulate your muscles to contract rapidly. So again, motor neuron signals will cause your muscles to contract rapidly. We hopefully have watched that video and we know how that they are doing that contraction now. But that um, contraction is going to generate heat energy because the contraction requires energy from um, respiration. And so we release some heat through that process because we should hopefully know that respiration releases some heat energy and that helps us to warm up basically. And so that kind of quick rapid contraction is basically a way of generating heat energy through increased rate of respiration. Your smooth muscle as well, and we looked and briefly at smooth muscles and the fact that we have layers of smooth muscle in our blood vessels. So these, as we said, are um, can be under control of the nervous system and they can be caused to contract or relax. And this is control called vasoconstriction when they contract. And that happens when you are cold or vasodilation, which means obviously to relax and dilate that lumen inside, which happens when you are too warm. Now, the reason they do this is because if you vasoconstrict those blood vessels, then less blood is able to flow through them. The volume of blood flowing through them is reduced. So we tend to do that for blood vessels near the skin and at the extremities. So fingers, toes, nose, ears, which is why they can become very, very cold. And some people have various syndromes where actually the, the lack of blood flow to those areas in the cold makes their hands and things actually go blue and can be very, very painful. Then the opposite is true when you get really hot and really sweaty. And if you do loads of exercise, sometimes you'll find out you have a very red face. And that's because when vasodilation happens, we're widening those blood vessels. So more blood is flowing through those capillaries that are close to the skin and also through the extremities to try and lose that heat energy or release that heat energy by radiating it out of your skin. Same with the um, vasoconstriction, we're doing the opposite by reducing the blood flow. That nice warm blood stays closer inside the body and we keep our blood, like the warm blood flowing around the kind of internal organs. And we don't want it flowing through the, the parts of the skin that are going to get the most cold so we don't lose that precious heat energy. OK, so this is temperature control as an example of things that happen when you're too hot and too cold. And the fact that it's um, innovated by the nervous system and controlled by recept and detected by receptors. And we've got a control centre in the brain, the hypothalamus. And this is going to keep moving it towards and away from that optimum 37 degrees C. We're going to look at obviously in a lot more detail at blood glucose and um, osmoregulation as well. But this is one of the examples, other examples that we have to know. Ouch! This is why in some videos I've explained scratches.